Last week we looked at the question that was posed by the Sadducees. And the Lord Jesus Christ answered them and silenced them. And we find here then in verse 39, following that, certain of the scribes answering said, Master, thou hast well said. But tonight we're going to gather from the other gospel records of the same incident. And we're to glean other information from Matthew and Mark to help us understand fully what was happening here. Because the other Gospels record that Christ was asked another question. Matthew and Mark tell of a Pharisee, a lawyer or a scribe who asks Christ, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Which is the greatest commandment in the law? And that question is not recorded for us in Luke's record of this occasion. And you will know really what Jesus said in answer to this, Master, what, which is the great commandment in the law? And to paraphrase, the Lord Jesus Christ answered by saying, The greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And you're to love your neighbor as yourself. And there the Lord Jesus quickly and concisely summed up the Ten Commandments. He summed up the first four commandments in relation to our duty towards God. And then he summed up the next six commandments in relation to our duty concerning our neighbor. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. And then we also find from the other gospel records that the scribe who answered the question congratulated the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, basically, whoever can do this is remarkable because this is more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. This truly does sum up the law of God. That basically was what he said to Jesus in response to uh, Jesus' answer to the question. And Jesus goes on then and says to him, When Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. And no man after that durst ask him any questions. And Matthew tells as much as what Luke says here. No man was able to answer him a word, neither does any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. So, we might say in modern parlance, the question and the answer session had come to an end as far as the Sadducees, as far as the Pharisees were concerned, and as far as the scribes were concerned. Jesus answered their questions and silenced them. They had nothing more to say. But the Lord Jesus Christ had something else to say to them. And we notice also from Matthew's account, the Pharisees were gathered together. When the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? And they give an answer. They say unto him, The son of David. And the answer that they give was, correct. It was accurate, but it wasn't complete. Whose son is he? And the Pharisees, they say unto him, the son of David. And this is really where we pick up Luke's account of this incident. Verse 41, for instance, and he say unto them, how say they that Christ 
is David's son. This was a common thing that the, the religious leaders of the day believed, that the Messiah was a descendant of David, of King David, of the one who wrote most of the Psalms, who was indeed a great hero of the people. And the Pharisees and the religious leaders and many of the people would acknowledge that the Messiah, when he would come, would come from the line of David. Now that was true. That was accurate. But it wasn't all true. There was more truth in it, which they did not seem to realize. And this is the question that the Lord Jesus poses them. He's turning the tables on them now, and he's asking them a question. And when we look at this, really the Lord Jesus is saying to them what he said to the Sadducees. When the Sadducees asked the question about the resurrection, how did Jesus begin? Well, he began, as we noticed in Mark's Gospel, he began by saying, Do ye not therefore err, because you know not the Scriptures, neither the power of God? Before he answered the Sadducees, this is what he said to them. You don't know the Scriptures, and you don't know the power of God. And in effect, this is what he was saying to the Pharisees. The Pharisees prided themselves in their knowledge of the Scriptures. And they had a, a good knowledge, but it was a partial knowledge. And there was one thing they were overlooking concerning the Messiah. Because it's not enough to say that he was David's son, true as it was. Yet the Scriptures that they profess to believe and accept say something more about the Messiah. And this is what Jesus goes on to say. Verse 42, And David himself saith in the book of Psalms, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. David therefore calleth him Lord. How is he then his son? That's the question that he posed to the Pharisees. They couldn't answer it. They would profess to know the Scriptures, but they couldn't answer this question. And it's important for us to realize here that Jesus doesn't answer the question. He poses it. They are dumbfounded. They cannot respond to it. And he leaves them in ignorance regarding the truth of this scripture. Now basically, for ourselves tonight, we want to make sure that we know what this scripture is talking about here that Jesus highlights. And basically the answer is that the Messiah was to be God as well as man. They were quite happy to accept that the Messiah, the Christ, the Anointed One, the great leader and deliverer they were expecting would come from the loins of David. He would be a, a direct descendant from King David. They were happy to accept that. But the Word of God says something more. He's not only man, he is God. As man, he was to be David's son, a direct descendant. As God, he was to be David's Lord. David's son is not merely David's descendant. He is David's Lord. Now this was, to them, they didn't understand it. They didn't grasp it. They knew the scripture. They could quote the scripture, probably, but they did not know the meaning of it. Being David's Lord, he is the Son of God. 
And therefore, the implication for them and for us is quite clear. Since he is the Son of God, everyone should give him his place and trust in the Son of God, in the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is basically what this piece of scripture here, that's a direct quotation from Psalm 110, the psalm that we're singing we have just sung a part of it and we're going to close our worship by singing the other part of it. It's referring to us the fact that the Messiah was indeed David's son by the flesh, but he was also the son of God. Well, we want to draw one or two things directly from these verses that we have read in Luke's Gospel for our edification this evening. And these are things that we can easily see from this from the scripture. First of all, we want to notice that the book of Psalms speaks of Christ. Now this is remarkable. We know that the Psalms were an old book written many, many years ago. Some of the Psalms would be written a thousand years before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But what? They speak of and they point towards the Lord Jesus. They point towards Christ, the Messiah. This is what we're told in verse 42. How say they that Christ is David's son? And many of the Psalms, many of the Psalms speak of the work and the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. We could name one or two very, very briefly. Psalm 2 tells us about the Anointed One, the Lord's Anointed, and how the, the world is against the Lord's Anointed. We sang a part of Psalm 16 this morning. That talks about the resurrection. It talks about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Psalm 22 speaks about the sufferings of Christ. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Psalm 69 also speaks about Christ, the Messiah, the one that would come. Psalm 50, 41 re reminds us about the time when Judas would betray the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And all the Psalms, they speak about his sufferings, his humiliation, Christ dying, Christ reigning over all. And therefore, friends, we are to go to the book of Psalms and we are to look for Christ. We are to look for him and we are to see him there in the Psalms. And the more that we know the Psalms, and the more that we're familiar with the Scriptures, the more we, be, we will be able to see the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is but one reason why we sing the Psalms. There are other reasons, of course, and we have highlighted them on other occasions. But this is one reason that we sing the Psalms, because they reveal unto us our Saviour. They reveal unto us that one who was to come, and who has come, and fulfilled all that was required in order to bring about a great and a glorious salvation. And therefore, friends, we know that the book of Psalms speaks of Christ, and therefore we are to be studying this book. We are to look into it. We are to do as Jesus told the Pharisees, search the Scriptures. This is what we're to do in order that we might have to reveal to us more of the glorious work and passion of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, not only do the Psalms reveal unto us Christ, but they reveal unto us the divinity of Christ. Here is something that is marvelous, wonderful. The Messiah, the one that was to come, was to be the God-man. And this is what Christ is. 
He is the God man. Perfect man, perfect God. A perfect Saviour. And if we don't honour the Lord Jesus Christ for what he truly is, we're not honouring him and we're not honouring the Father. We know that the cults, they will talk about Jesus. They will use the same kind of words that we will use in our gospel presentation. But the words that they use don't mean exactly what we would mean when we use these words. To us, friends, the Lord Jesus is God in the flesh. And that's the only Savior that can save us. He is man and he is God. He is the only mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And we have to be able to discern when the Jehovah Witnesses or others might come to our door and they'll talk to us in language that we're familiar and they'll speak of Jesus Christ as if they're serving him. But it's not the Jesus of the Bible. It's another Jesus. It's a Jesus of their imagination. But the Psalms not only speak of him, but as this Psalm has been revealed to us here, it talks about his divinity. God in the flesh. Truly the Savior that we need. And he is therefore the one that we are to trust. He's the one that we're to lean upon. He's the one that we are to receive. He's the one that we are to delight in the great love that is lavished upon his people in all that he did. It is the God-man. That is the only Savior. There is no other. There may be many imitators, but there's none that will take you to heaven but Christ, the one who has come from heaven. Well, the book of Psalms reveals unto us Christ. It reveals unto us the divinity of Christ. But we can open this up and we can enlarge it, friends. We would tell you that the whole of the Old Testament is telling us about the Lord Jesus. This is obviously more difficult for us. We have to truly search the scriptures. We have to apply ourselves to this. But the more that we're familiar with the scriptures the more that we will find Christ in even the Old Testament. We find them there right at the very beginning in the first book of the Bible. We see him in that gospel promise in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. And a saviour has promised, one who will bruise the head of Satan. Who is that to be? That is none other than the Son of God who became the Son of Man. The Old Testament may, may well be regarded as a book preparing for the coming, for the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what happened. And we could even open it up and enlarge it and say the whole of the scriptures testify to the Lord Jesus Christ. Not just the Old Testament that was in preparation for his coming, but the New Testament we find there in the Gospels, the Gospel record of the Lord Jesus, His incarnation, His birth, His life, His teachings, His sufferings, His death, His resurrection, His ascension. The book of Acts, we looked very briefly at it this morning. What does it tell us? It tells us about the Acts of the Apostles. But truly, it could also be entitled the Acts of Christ through the Holy Spirit. Christ is now working in heaven, as it were. He's no longer upon the earth, but he's still building his church. And the epistles, what do they talk about? What do they teach us about? They are telling us about the churches that have been formed and how Christ is working even in his churches. And the book of Revelation 
It reveals unto us ultimately that complete and final victory of the Lord Jesus. He goes forth as a conqueror to conquer. And the kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. We are therefore to understand that this is Christ's book. It testifies to him. It's a book that speaks from cover to cover concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why we read from John chapter 5, <clears throat> that incident when Jesus is disputing and debating with those who found offence when he healed on the Sabbath day. He says to them, search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. We know that we are to read the Word of God. That's true. But Jesus is telling us here, the exhortation is to search the Scriptures. Not just read them, but to search them. And it means to search minutely and diligently. Because these people there knew the Scriptures. They knew the very words of them, but they didn't know the meaning. And that was true for the Pharisees, and it was also true for the Sadducees. And it may well be true for some of us here that tonight we may be somewhat familiar with the Scriptures, but we're still to search, we're still to be diligent and look into the Scriptures that we might see more of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Psalms, the Old Testament, the New Testament, God's book speaks cover to cover about Christ the Lord and how he has come down from heaven in order to save a people, to call them out of the world, to call them and to take them into his kingdom, and to follow him into eternal life. And do we know anything of this, friends? Do we know anything of the Savior calling us from our lives of sin and embracing him as he is freely offered to us in the gospel? Because that would sum up the Bible. It's about what Christ has done in order to save a people. And can we put our amen to that? Well, secondly, we might notice from these verses that we're looking at here, not only do the Scriptures testify to Christ and to his divinity, but they also tell us that Christ is a king. Christ is a king. David himself saith in the book of Psalms, verse 42, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand. We noticed the Pharisees believed that the Christ would be the son of David. They had an understanding, but they had to go, they had to have a deeper understanding and a more fuller understanding of what the text meant. And this may well be the same for us. Do we recognize that Christ indeed is a king, is a king. He's a ruler. We are told here, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand. This is a place of power and authority. Many people today find this foreign to think of the Lord Jesus, the Savior, baby Jesus in a manger, as a king, as a ruler. But that is the case. This is what he said to his, to his disciples. 
before he left them, before he ascended, before he gave them the commission to go into all the world and to make disciples of all nations. He tells them in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. All power. That's a king. And he has a kingdom. And he's exercising this kingdom and this kingdom power even today. Even now. Even now as, he's at this, as he sits at God's right hand, Christ is a king. He's a ruler. He is an absolute ruler. That's what we find. Sit thou at my right hand. Too many people think that Christ is some weak individual who cannot do anything, who is limited. Not so. That's not the biblical description of Christ. He is a glorious king, even now. He has a kingdom that will never, ever end. A glorious kingdom. Yes, we have to admit that we only see this today with the eye of faith. We only know this because the Scriptures reveals it unto us. We are living in a world of chaos, and this may seem strange to us that Christ, the one who was crucified and who has risen again, is indeed actually a king reigning and ruling. But that is it. That is true. That's what we find. This is what the psalm is saying. A thousand years even before he came. Even before the Messiah came. Well not only is he a king friends. But he's one who will rule absolutely. And what I mean by that thirdly is. Christ will destroy his enemies. We find that again in our, in our verses we read. Verse 43. Till I make thine enemies thy footstool. What does this suggest to you? Till I make thine enemies thy footstool. Well it tells us quite clearly that Christ will have enemies. And we know that today. The floods have lifted up. As they've always done, they're all against Christ and against his cause and against his church. But Christ is a king who will reign absolutely and all his enemies, no matter how many they may be, will be utterly destroyed. This is again something that many modern people will find somewhat repugnant. Jesus Meek and mild. This doesn't go along with what we believe and what we think. But here we have it in the word of God. Till I make thine enemies thy footstool. What's a footstool for? It is a place where someone rests their feet upon. And that's what Christ will do. He will rest his feet upon his enemies. He will be able to subdue all his enemies. He is therefore a glorious ruler who will ultimately win that final and complete victory. He will overcome all opposition over all his enemies. Our catechism, does it not teach us this? How doth Christ execute the office of a king. He is a prophet and he is a priest and he is a king. But how does he execute that office of a king? Christ executed the office of a king in subduing us to himself, in ruling and defending us, and in restraining and conquering all his and our enemies. Christ is a fighter. 
He's a ruler. He will overcome. This is glorious. This is wonderful. This is the Christ of the Bible. This might be a Christ that we may be not familiar with. We have not thought about it. We don't think of him on, on these terms as an absolute king with absolute rule and he will destroy all his enemies. To the true-hearted believer, friends, this encourages us. This causes us to prostrate ourselves before him and to worship him. This is what we're meant to do. We're meant to recognize that, yes, he's David's son, but he's also David's Lord. And we are to put our faith and our trust upon this person. We are to be found in him. We are to have a, an interest in him. I should have said at the beginning, what was my title for uh, this, this sermon? Well, the title is quite clear. What do you think of Christ? What do you think of Christ? This is really what he's talking about here. What do you think of Christ? They had a one-sided view of Christ. We must have a, a full-orbed view of Christ. This one who indeed the whole of scriptures testifies to. This one who is a king. And this one who will one day overrule all his enemies subdue them do we never know anything of this at all the psalm that we sang the portion that we sang earlier a willing people in thy day of power shall come to thee do we know anything of this great king subduing us unto himself this is what he does None of us will come to Christ left to ourselves. The Lord Jesus Christ must subdue our natural hostility towards him and his claims. Oh, he, he doesn't twist our arms and, and we don't come to him against our wills. We're not saying that for one moment. But by the grace of God, those who were once unwilling become willing in the day of his power. That's the kind of king he is. He subdues even rebels unto himself. What then do you think of Christ? It is possibly the most important question you can ask yourself. What do you think of Christ? What does he mean to you? Is he just the son of David according to the flesh? Is he just David's greater son? Or is he the God-man? The perfect saviour. The perfect redeemer. That one to whom all the scriptures testifies to to that one who is king, and to that one who is a glorious ruler. Friends, the, inv the invitation is there to you. Come, come unto him. Be found in him. Trust in him as David did, because he was David's Lord. What do you think of Christ? Amen. And may the Lord be pleased to bless his word to us.